Hi and thank you so much for watching. In the previous video, part 2 of the series, we looked at this timeline in which we showed how Daniel 12 clearly applies to the time that we currently live in, especially when we consider events that occurred over the past 3 years. In part 3, we will look at more astonishing discoveries that further confirm the previous two videos in this series. If you haven't seen the previous two videos, I would highly recommend watching them first before continuing with this one. If you are ready to continue with part 3, let's begin. The question I would like to address today is this. What does the Bible tell us about Jesus' opinion of those who search the scriptures looking for a specific date that could mark his return? And also which calendar should we use when we consider this matter? This question is something that few may think about because most would simply form their own opinion on the matter. And in most cases that view is a very negative one. Today, however, we would like to look at what God's word shows us about Jesus' opinion of people who look at specific dates, not just the season for his return. We'll start by considering the clearly defined pattern provided when Jesus first came to the earth as the suffering servant to shed his blood for the sins of the world. In Luke 19, Jesus is clearly giving us his opinion of Israel and their knowledge, or rather the lack thereof, concerning the time at which their Messiah would reveal himself to them, and we will consider this in light of the information that was provided to them through prophecies. And when he was come near, he beheld the city, and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee in on every side, and shalt lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. From this passage it is very clear to see that Jesus was sad and disappointed about the fact that his people, Israel, did not know the time of their visitation, since they were given a very clear picture of what to look for, from Zechariah 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem! Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just, and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt the foal of an ass. As Israel failed to perceive the fulfillment of the Zechariah 9 prophecy, Jesus pronounced upon them a curse of blindness and eventual destruction. They failed to recognize the signs signaling the revelation of their Messiah on that particular day. And the next logical question we need to ask would be, was Israel ever given the information to know when to expect their Messiah? And was Jesus unjust in anticipating their awareness of this timing? The response lies within Daniel chapter 9 verse 25, and I can highly recommend teachings on this by Chuck Missler, in which a comprehensive explanation concerning this subject is provided. Know therefore and understand, that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks, and threescore and two weeks, the street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. In Daniel 9, Gabriel provides a precise timeline for Israel to anticipate their Messiah. This spanned 69 weeks, equivalent to 483 years, commencing from Artaxerxes' decree to rebuild Jerusalem. Remarkably, Israel didn't need a specific calendar to decipher this duration. All they needed was to identify the starting point and subsequently count the designated years to pinpoint the year when their Messiah would embark on fulfilling the Lord's feasts. This gives us a robust model to employ in seeking information regarding the next instance of Israel's Messiah, our bridegroom, visiting us. You may ask, what model is that? Well, God knew that there would be multiple calendars in play in our time that would lead to much speculation and confusion, and as such he designed a model that would allow us, who have entered the end time, to discover the exact day of his next visitation without the need of any calendar. That model consists of Gabriel providing a starting point that is followed by a specific duration that culminates in the Messiah's visitation day. In the first instance, Gabriel pointed Daniel to the day on which Artaxerxes would send out a decree that Jerusalem is to be rebuilt. 
and this was then followed by 69 weeks of years, or 483 years, which led to the exact year in which Israel's Messiah fulfilled the first four feasts of the Lord. Are there any other instances of such a model that we can find, given to Daniel by Gabriel? We find exactly what we are looking for, modeled after the same pattern as that of the first instance in Daniel chapter 12. And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Blessed is he that waiteth, and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. In verse 11, Gabriel announces a starting point that, as with the model for the first instance, could only be identified after it happened, and which is linked to a decree. A decree that affected normal life for every person in this world, as prophesied by Gabriel, was made by the World Health Organization on March 11, 2020. This point in time, as in the first instance, could only be identified once it occurred. This marked the starting point of the 1290 days, and we are about to reach the end of that period. The fact that a decree is associated with normal life ending for all people in the world confirms that we know exactly where the starting point of the 1290 days is positioned. Many have asked what about earlier possibilities, but none of those instances had decrees associated with them that affected the entire world as the decree of March 11th did. Gabriel does not tell Daniel what would happen at the end of the 1290 days, because if he revealed that information, everyone, even the foolish, would have understood the message before the time of the end. Gabriel said that the understanding of this message is only given to the wise, and that the secret would only be revealed in the time of the end to believers who know that Amos 3 verse 7 would also apply to those who live in the end times, just before our bridegroom returns. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants the prophets. If we apply Gabriel's model in which the first coming of the Messiah is announced, to Daniel 12 verse 11, we know the exact day of the Messiah's arrival. Without living through the events that played out over the past three years, which included a decree that took away normal daily life, we would not have been in a position to unlock this mystery. As in the first instance, no calendar is required to calculate the day. All that is needed is the identification of the starting point that is associated with a decree and then calculating the day of our bridegroom's visitation by adding the specified period provided by Gabriel to the starting point. Having this understanding then, we see that our bridegroom expected his chosen nation, Israel, to know the time of their visitation when he came the first time. And when they failed this test, they were cursed with destruction and blindness. Should we expect our bridegroom to feel differently about us, living in the time of the end, and to whom it was promised to receive an understanding of Gabriel's sealed up words to Daniel? If we intend to follow in Israel's footsteps, and if we continue to intentionally avoid looking for the day on which our bridegroom expects us to be ready for his arrival. When we know that Gabriel said that this secret would be revealed to the wise in the end times, why are so many of God's children still content with only looking for the season of our bridegroom's return? Can you see how many children of God have become lazy, or they simply do not care about that which is important to our bridegroom? especially when we consider the times that we live in. I know that many will immediately quote Matthew 24 verse 35 and 36 and Mark 13 verse 31 to 32, which is simply a really poor excuse for being willingly ignorant. Consider carefully what Jesus said about the time that only the Father knows about. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Heaven and earth shall pass away, 
but my words shall not pass away. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. When Jesus said that day, which day is he referring to? What is the context that is provided to us in these passages? Can we read our own context into the scripture? I think you will agree with me that these passages associate the day with heaven and earth passing away. It clearly says so. It has nothing to do with the rapture, the start of Satan's reign over the earth, or even Jesus' second coming to the earth, where he will set up his millennial kingdom. All of these events have to occur before heaven and earth are destroyed. You simply cannot find any of these preceding events referred to in these passages, and any references in which these passages are applied to the rapture are simply out of context. This would also imply that Jesus' view of those who did not know the day of his visitation will be different when he comes a second time, contradicting what we read in Hebrews 13. Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. If we love our Lord and Savior above everything else, should our desire to be with him not propel us to search out the time of our appointment with him? Knowing that we will soon be standing in his presence, should we not be overwhelmed with excitement to the extent that we would leave everything behind and sell everything we have to buy the field in which that treasure is buried? Perhaps most believers do not want to involve themselves in this matter because looking at a specific day comes with the risk of being ridiculed for being wrong and the immense disappointment that apparently will lead to many people losing their faith. Those are some of the comments I've received in the past when searching for answers to this mystery. Faith in Jesus that can so easily be lost is in my opinion really no faith at all. Perhaps such a child of God loves this world far more than they look forward to being with their Lord and Savior and discovering what he had prepared for them that love him. These two passages from Matthew and Mark are very convenient exit strategies for allowing someone to focus on their lives in this world and to avoid any ridicule from their peers. Just as Israel did not see it as important to know when their Messiah would arrive 2,000 years ago, so too do many believers today not know that discovering the date of their bridegroom's arrival is a matter of great importance to him. In light of the information that was shared with you today, do you really believe that our bridegroom wants us not to know the day on which he will come for us? If he cursed Israel because they had no desire to look for the day, it would be wise, in my opinion, to do things differently in our case, especially when we have the benefit of learning something from others who failed in the past. Why is it important to know the date of our bridegroom's arrival? I can only share with you my view on this matter. But just as with a normal wedding, a bride prepares herself in the hours leading up to the moment when she is married. She does not get dressed in her wedding gown three months before the wedding, walking around with it and never cleansing herself just in case she is informed that the time has arrived. Imagine seeing a bride with a wedding gown that has been worn for several months or even years before the wedding day arrives, never cleansing herself or the gown before the wedding because she wants to be ready at any moment. It is easy to see why an earthly bridegroom would not be pleased with such a bride, but he would welcome with open arms one who knows when to be ready and who allowed him to cleanse her with the water of the word before the marriage takes place. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with a washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. When a bride does not know when she is getting married, even though this may be part of the romanticized Jewish wedding customs, it would point to a lack of intimacy with the bridegroom during the time in which the bridegroom prepares a place for her in his father's house. Although this lack of intimacy clearly applies to Israel, it should most certainly not apply to the church, having received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. When we are filled with the Holy Spirit, our spirits become one with the Holy Spirit, and we enter into intimacy with the bridegroom. In an intimate relationship, there are no longer any secrets. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one Spirit. When we are saved and have received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, there should be no lack of intimacy. 
And what Jesus knows, we should know too. The following passages attest to this. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. Evil men understand not judgment, but they that seek the Lord understand all things. Our bridegroom desires that we seek him out early, and why would we not want to? Nothing in this world is worth not making him our first priority. When we know the time of the wedding, which we could only discover as believers who live in the end times, after a decree was made that pointed a starting point out to us, and to which we can apply Gabriel's model for announcing our bridegroom's visitations, we can properly prepare ourselves for our marriage to the bridegroom, and not arrive with a soiled wedding gown when many will be caught unawares. We do this by focusing on him and not the world in the time leading up to the wedding, and ensuring that we allow him to cleanse us with the water of his word, so that he can present us to himself without spot or wrinkle. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with a washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The next thing that is directly connected to this and which is also hinted at on the timeline that we discussed in the previous video has to do with what Jesus did as soon as He arrived in Jerusalem as Israel's Messiah. Many have asked me to expound on the purpose of the latter rain that will follow the rapture, and what happens to those who were raptured after this 40-day period has expired. We can once again find our answers by looking at the model that is provided to us in God's word. What did Jesus do immediately after arriving in Jerusalem as Israel's Messiah? He went directly to the temple to get rid of the abomination that was standing in his father's house. And he went into the temple, and began to cast out them that sold therein, and them that bought, saying unto them, It is written, My house is the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. What was the abomination that Jesus removed from his father's house after arriving in Jerusalem? He cast out the money changers from the temple, which converted a place of worship into a marketplace. This is once again a model provided to us so that we can understand events that are happening in our time. Shortly after the WHO decreed a global pandemic, a patent was issued to Microsoft in which the temple of our bodies would become a place where the money changers would invade the dwelling of the Holy Spirit within us and set up their trading activities once again. If we look at the patent that was issued to Microsoft, not only do we see that it is associated with the number of the beast, which is 666, but this patent is for a system generating cryptocurrency based on human body activity data. This mirrors the situation that Jesus faced when he cast the money changers out of the temple in Jerusalem. Jesus does not want the temples of our bodies to become the place where currency is generated or traded. I believe God's word clearly shows us that the purpose of the latter reign will be to restore the temples of those who were invaded by today's money changers and to allow those vessels to be fit for the Holy Spirit once again. In this sense, we can also refer to the model provided to us in the case of Noah's flood. The rain that came over the earth for 40 days and 40 nights and which covered the entire world had a cleansing effect on the world where all flesh had been corrupted. Every person during Noah's days whose flesh was corrupted and who was found to be outside the ark when the rain started were subject to the cleansing power of the rain that our Heavenly Father sent. After the flood there remained no corrupted flesh on the earth except for Ham's wife who carried the offspring of corrupted flesh in her at the time when they boarded the ark. If you are wondering about this and want to study this for yourself, I will give you some hints. 
Ask yourself the following questions. How did the Nephilim arrive on the earth after the flood, as stated in Genesis 6? There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. What did Jesus mean with the parable in which leaven is hidden in three measures of meal? Another parable spake he unto them. The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, till the whole was leavened. This parable starts with Noah's flood and ends when Jesus returns at his second coming. Why does the Holy Spirit highlight the name of Canaan, emphasizing Canaan more than once when speaking about Ham? And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem, and Ham, and Japheth, and Ham is the father of Canaan. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brethren without. Finally, why did Noah curse Canaan for Ham's transgression? And Noah awoke from his wine, and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan! A servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. It is my opinion that just as every person on the outside of the ark was subjected to the cleansing work of the rain that flooded the earth, so too will every person that remains on the earth after the rapture be affected by the latter rain that will prepare the world for the second outpouring of the Holy Spirit. This will not be a physical rain but a spiritual rain, and those who will be working the harvest will be the raptured believers that are referred to in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16 to 17, together with Jesus and the 24 elders. The impact of this work will be so great that there will be not a single person, regardless of what they believe before this time, who would not know with 100% certainty that Jesus Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This work will prepare those who remain on the earth to receive the second outpouring of the Holy Spirit and for the subsequent persecution that will be severe, and in which the Antichrist will once again insist that God's people allow the money changers to set up their stalls in people's bodies that are supposed to be dwelling places for the Holy Spirit. Those who follow the Antichrist will do so knowing that they are receiving a mark of permanent ownership that will be placed on them by the Antichrist. I will end the video at this point and I hope that the information has been a blessing to you. Several other points remain that still need to be discussed but I hope that this has opened your eyes to the truth of God's word and that we can truly know how Jesus feels about those who do not know the time of their appointment with him. In the next video we will look at how the Revelation 12 sign which occurred on September 23rd, 2017 fit into this timeline and its significance. Since many are saying that nothing really happened on that day and looking back, what are we to make of it now? There is actually a lot more here than meets the eye. If you have any questions or comments about this or the information that we discussed today, please post them in the comment section below and I will do my best to include the answers to your questions in the next video. Also be sure to watch this video if you have not seen it yet. In it you will find essential information on how to get ready and how to prepare for the marriage feast of the bridegroom. Until next time or until we meet in the air, God bless.